there was no containment building, all of these fission products just blew through the roof and up into the surrounding countryside. This is a picture of what the core looked like from the air. No building in the way, nothing to stop those debris from going. It's another aerial picture right after the accident. Of course, this was quite a disaster. And the world noticed. Some of the first people to notice were scientists, I think, in southern Germany, near Switzerland. They had some detectors set up, and they said, oh, it's going to rain. Um, sometimes you can see the fallout from earlier atomic weapons tests in their very sensitive detectors. And when they were looking at this experiment and the rain was coming down, they said, oh my god, this isn't from some 10-year-ago nuclear experiment. This looks like the entire core contents of a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor in Sweden with very sensitive radiation detection monitoring because, of course, you want to make sure nothing goes wrong in your own reactor. The alarm starts going off because of the stuff coming in the air from outside. The Soviet Union was at first very tight-lipped about this. No free press, no great way to try to describe what's happening in the world. They mobilized their own fire department, of course, right in the local Chernobyl fire department. And those were the fatalities. The firefighters wanted to put out the fire on the building. And maybe they were heroes or maybe they needed more training because by putting out those fires, they absorbed enormous radiation doses and over the next few days got radiation sickness and maybe over the next few weeks perished, 30 people. The major effect on health from the Chernobyl incident was all of these fission products, these radioactive high-level waste now shot up into the atmosphere because there was no containment building. And what's going to happen is the wind will blow and this fallout, this radioactive material, will move across the countryside. Let's watch a video that shows where the wind conditions were on those days and therefore where the radiation plumes would go with the fallout. So there is Chernobyl power plant in the northern part of the Ukraine. And you can see that the immediate wind pushing the fallout was right towards Sweden. In fact, it was a Swedish nuclear power plant that first even noticed that some radiation was coming out because, of course, the Soviet Union was not big at publicity. Then you notice that the wind shifts back going to the east. And there was pollution all the way up to the Lap people in Siberia. We now have wind currents pushing back down, coming towards covering Poland and more of Central Europe. And you can always find Chernobyl because it's still spewing out radioactive material even though we're now here at May 1st, a few days later. The winds change, going to the south and then pushing back to the east. And one thing to note, that even though it looks like all of Europe is covered, this means there was detectable levels of cesium at one point. But it doesn't mean just because there was fallout over a certain area that the people are all going to die or the people are contaminated. The areas that have had the most coverage of red over some time will probably have quite a bit of stuff on the ground. And we'll get to that in a moment. But pretty soon here, we're at the 4th of May, 5th of May, that they did finally get the reactor all covered up. Because you've noticed this has been a continual source. And shortly here, you'll see that the source stops. Because they finally are no longer taking more material out from the reactor. Here is an actual map of the actual cesium-137, the radioactive material that is actually still measurable in the ground from the Chernobyl incident. And if we uh, blow up the worst zones, you can see that they are here, right near the Chernobyl reactor itself, and some other places that got the immediate and the most numbers of plumes. The stuff that's in red on here is still a closed, restricted zone, a place where basically they don't let people go. 
The people in the, in the next there is a much more heavily uh, monitored zone as well as the light pink. And the yellow place is sort of back to normal. Yes, you can measure the amount of cesium still in the ground, but it's deemed low enough that people can continue their normal lives in those areas. The dark red zones, particularly the town of Pripyat, right next to the Chernobyl reactor, are abandoned to this day. And they are basically empty collections of buildings because the pollution level was just too high. Now you might wonder, why are we talking about cesium-137 and also iodine-131? Well, the fission products from a nuclear reactor, the things the uranium splits into, have a wide variety of different isotopes. And they have different half-lives. Things that have half-lives of millions or billions of years, well, they don't decay, they don't give off radiation all that often, and so it's not as dangerous. The things that have a very short half-life, minutes, hours, well, they're extremely dangerous if you're next to them because that's what they're decaying and giving off the radiation, but they're all gone. So it's the things in the middle range, the hundreds, thousand-year range, that have the most potential damage, particularly things that your body will take up. Iodine is one of those. You have iodine in your thyroid, and you need it. So if there's radioactive iodine, it will go into your thyroid and then maybe give you a much higher incidence of thyroid cancer because those gamma rays coming from it will hurt your cells. Cesium can be taken up in the bone. There's not a large, quick replacement of material that's in your bone. So those two isotopes are a good marker and a good thing to notice and to therefore avoid. So if we look at what are the health effects of all of this fallout, fortunately, it can be measured fairly accurately. The first thing is the people who were the radiation workers, the immediate responders, the firemen. This reactor was on fire. There's large glowing chunks of the core around, and the people working there rushed out to fix it. They rushed to their deaths. Of the initial 30-some firemen, they did all die of radi acute radiation sickness. In all told, there were 134 people diagnosed with acute radiation sickness. This is getting something like at least 200 rems of radiation. And from that 134 people that were uh, diagnosed with acute radiation sickness, 47 of them died. This, of course, is the immediate effect. What about the long-term effect of the people that were, were inundated with this fallout? Well, the economic effect was probably one of the largest because places that uh, had the radioactive material, the, say the, the strontium or the cesium on the ground, and then cows ate it and the cows gave milk, all that milk had to be thrown away. Many of the animals had to be slaughtered and not eaten. That many of the vegetables that were growing over this time period where the material would get onto the leaves or incorporated in the plant had to be thrown away. So there was a clear economic impact of the immediate fallout wash across all of this area. But there were also people, particularly children, who are growing quickly. And in Poland and in some other places, I think they wisely administered potassium iodide. If you think about your thyroid, and it's going to take up iodine from your diet, if you suddenly eat a whole bunch of iodine, not straight iodine, it's poisonous, but in some form that's not poisonous, now the small amount of radioactive iodine you might get is very diluted. So the chance of your thyroid picking it up it when you've eaten a whole potassium iodide tablet is low. And that's very helpful because there clearly were a large number of thyroid cancers detected in children that normally would not, of course, be at that rate. Fortunately, 98.8% survival rate of childhood thyroid cancer is quite possible and was in this case. Of this higher incidence of thyroid cancer, which is relatively rare, but here, of course, in the fallout areas, it was noticeably up, maybe 4,000 cases of 
thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer being diagnosed and treated is extremely treatable, a 98.8% uh, success rate of, of, quote, curing or eliminating that cancer. This has led so far to 15 deaths. But when we not just look at immediate things, we look at long-term health consequences, we wonder that will people die sooner than they would have otherwise. There were 600,000 people. Many of these were the workers, that, um, the army soldiers that went in to try to build the sarcophagus around the reactor. Or it was the people in those red zones that received quite a bit of fallout. This group is estimated to have had at least 10 rems of radiation. Now, of this 600,000, of course, some have already died, but in any group of 600,000 people, 20, 30 years later, some amount will have died. And the key is to ask, statistically, how many more deaths will there be from this cohort than there would otherwise? Everyone dies, and an awful lot of people, maybe a quarter of the people who die, die of cancer. Statistically, though, this is a large enough dose and a large enough number that the estimate will be that maybe 4,000 excess deaths will occur from this. Of course, we don't know this exactly, and we can't tell which person will be an excess cancer death, but this is a fairly accepted number in this range. Now, there clearly were millions, maybe six million more people, right, that all received dose maybe on the order of one rem. And the question is, will this give us any excess deaths? The linear hypothesis, which we described, says, oh yes, of course, we get 10 times more, they had 10 times less dose, that should be another 4,000 people. But the threshold hypothesis, or maybe theory, says radiation dose at a low enough level is something your body has um, evolved with, and it's something your body can actually cure uh, and deal with, since you're always exposed to some level of radiation. Remember, CT scan is 1.2 rem, so this is not, uh, maybe that's three times your annual background over this shorter time period. So will there be any excess deaths from here? Hard to quantify or tell. While this might be the science, there is very much still a psychological aspect. And since our brain and our bodies are so well linked, there are more potential medical problems. Stress disorders, my gosh, I was at Chernobyl, I was nearby, I must have received radiation, I feel sick, and probably really are. Weather had nothing to do with radiation, but it's still real. The other thing is in terminology. This group of people, the 600,000, are being monitored continuously because while it wasn't an intentional experiment, at least we do have an experiment and data and tracking people to look at long-term health effects of radiation exposure. This group is known as the Chernobyl victims. And just by that choice of words, it leads people to feel that, oh my gosh, I'm going to have some health effects from this. Perhaps the term Chernobyl survivors would have been much better. That's what you need to know about the health effects of Chernobyl.